Axiochus by Plato, translated by George Burgess. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Axiochus, or On Death. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates, Cleinias, Axiochus. Socrates, when I had gone out on the road to Knosargus and had arrived at the Elysus, the voice of someone reached me, calling out, Socrates, Socrates, and when on turning towards the sound I looked round to see from whence it might be, I beheld Cleinias, the son of Axiochus, running towards the fountain Caliroe, together with Damon, the musician, and Carmides, the son of Glaucon. Of these, one was the other's music master, and the other was, from a feeling of friendship, at once the loving and beloved. I determined, therefore, to give up the direct road, and to meet them, that we might come together in the easiest manner. And Cleinias, with tears in his eyes, said, Now, Socrates, is the time for you to exhibit the wisdom ever brooded by you, for my father has at some sudden season become powerless, and is at the end of life, and with pain supports the idea of dissolution, although at a former period he used to ridicule those who were afraid of the bugbear of death, and to rebuke them mildly. Come then, and console him, as you are wont, in order that he may without a groan proceed on the road of fate, and that together with the remaining acts of piety, this too may be done by me. In no moderate matter, Cleinias, said I, shall you be disappointed in me, especially as you are inviting me to do a holy act. Let us, then, make haste, for if such is the state of affairs, there is a need of haste. Cleinias, on merely seeing you, Socrates, he will rally, for often has he been on his legs again after a serious symptom. Socrates, when we had traversed rather quickly the road along the wall at the Etonian gates, for he dwells near there, close to the pillar of the Amazon, we came upon him when he had already recovered his senses and his body some strength, although his mind was weak, and he stood greatly in need of consolation, and frequently did he raise himself up and give vent to moans together with the shedding of tears and the noisy beating of his hands. On beholding him, Why is this, Axiochus, said I? Where are your former boastings and frequent praises of virtue, and your boldness not to be broken down, since, like a cowardly combatant, you have exhibited yourself of noble bearing in the place of exercise, but have failed in the fight? Will not you, a man of so long a life, and the hearer of the finest reasonings, and, if nothing else, at least an Athenian, after surveying nature, consider that this is surely a common saying, and brooded amongst all, that life is a kind of sojourn upon earth, and that we must pass through it in a reasonable and good-tempered manner, and take our departure, only not singing paeans on the road to fate, while to conduct yourself in so cowardly a manner and to be torn with difficulty from existence, is to exhibit, like a child, a period of life not overwise. Axiochus, this Socrates is true, and you appear to me to speak correctly, and yet I know not how, when I am at the very point of what is dreadful, those powerful and very clever reasonings unconsciously fall away, and are held in no honour, while in their stead a fear lays hold of me, tearing my mind in various ways, if I am to be deprived of this light here, and of the good things of life, and to lie rotting wherever it may be, unseen and unheard of, after passing into worms and nondescript creatures. Socrates. Through your own ignorance, Axiochus, you are combining sensation with the want of sensation, and you are acting and speaking in a manner at variance with yourself and you do not consider that you are at one and the same time lamenting your want of sensation, and pained at the idea of your rotting away, and of being deprived of what is pleasant, as if you are to die 
and to live in another state, and not to pass into insensibility complete, and the same as that before you were born. As, then, none of the mischief during the political period of Draco and Cleisthenes pertained to yourself, for you, to whom it might have pertained, did not exist at all, so it will not after death occur to you, for you, to whom it might occur, will not be in existence. Throw aside, then, all silliness of this kind, and think upon this, that after the union of soul with body has been once dissolved by the former being settled in its own home place, what is left of the latter is of the earth, and devoid of reason, nor is it a man. For we are soul, a thing of life, and immortal, pent up in a mortal prison, and nature has for some mischief fitted round this tabernacle, to which pleasant things are in a recess, and on the wing, and mixed up with the majority of pains. But the things of sorrow are unmixed, and last a long time, and have no share in what is pleasant. I say nothing of diseases and inflammations in the sensoria, and of internal ills, with which the soul, as if sown with pores, does when it sympathizes, of necessity desire its congenial atmosphere of heaven, and feels a thirst for the life that is there, and a hankering after its dancing, so that a removal from this life is but a change from an evil to a good. Axiochus, since then, Socrates, you consider life to be an ill, why do you remain in it? And this, too, when you are a person of reflection, and excel us the mass in mind. Socrates. You do not, Axiochus, testify truly in my case, but you conceive, as the mass of Athenians do, that, since I am a searcher after facts, I am acquainted with something. And, indeed, I would pray to know all things of even a common kind, so much am I deficient in what are superior. But what I am now saying are the proclaimed doctrines of Prodicus the wise, that have been bought some for half a dram, others for two drams, and others for four, for that person never teaches anything for nothing, but his custom is perpetually to proclaim the sentiment of Epicharmus. Hand, hand washes, give then something, and get something in return. And lately, when he was making a display at the house of Callias, the son of Hipponicus, he spoke so much against living, that I drew a line through the word life as a thing of the least value, and from that time, Axiochus, my soul yearned for death. Axiochus, and what was said then? Socrates, I will tell you all I can remember, for what part of life, said he, is free from pain? Does not the infant cry at its first birth, beginning to live from pain? Nor is it deficient in any suffering, but is affected painfully, either by the want of something, or excessive cold or heat, or a blow, and being unable to tell what it is suffering, it cries continually, possessing this voice alone of its discontentment. And, when it reaches its seventh year, after having gone through many troubles, there are boy-leaders, and teachers of grammar, and drilling-masters tyrannizing over them. And, as he grows bigger, there is a still larger number of despots, who teach him correctness in composition, and geometry, and military tactics. And, when he is registered amongst the young men, there are, what is a worse fear, the Lyceum and Academy, and the Gymnasiarchs, and their staves, and a measureless amount of ills. And, the whole period of youth is under moderators, and the selection of those placed over young persons by the counsel of the Areopagus, and, when he is forced from them, cares straightway come upon him in secret, and considerations as to what road of life he is to tread, and, compared with the after difficulties, the first appear to be childish, and the terrors in truth of infants, for there are campaigns and wounds, and continuous contests, and then old age stealthily and unconsciously comes on, to which flow together all that is on the verge of death and hard to be remedied. And, should a person not pay, as a debt, his life rather quickly, nature, like an usurer, 
stands near and takes as a pledge from one his eyesight and from another his hearing and frequently both and should he still delay she brings on a paralysis or a mutilation or a distortion of limbs while they who on the threshold of old age are still vigorous in mind become twice children though grown old and hence even the gods who take cognizance of human affairs release more quickly from life those on whom they set the greatest value for example agamedes and trophonius who built up the close sacred to the god at pusa did after praying that the best thing might befall them lay themselves on their bed and never rise from it again so too the sons of the priestess at argos after their mother had in like manner prayed for some honour to be paid them by juno in return for their piety when through the pair of mules being too late they undressed themselves and drew her in the car to the temple they did after the prayer change during the night their existence and long would be the story to go through of the poets who with their more divine mouths have told in holy hymns the tales relating to life how they utter lamentations against living of one alone i will however remember me the most worthy to be spoken of who says the gods were mortals in a hapless state to live in sorrow wove the web of fate and of all that breathe and creep upon the earth there's not than man more wretched from his birth and what does he say of Amphiaraeus? him heartily the aegis-bearing zeus loved and apollo with the feelings all of friendship yet he did not of old age the threshold reach and what does he appear to you who bids us weep for the ills to which the new-born comes but i will stop here lest contrary to my engagement i become prolix by making mention of others likewise with what pursuit or art does not he who has chosen it find fault and is discontented with his present state let us go to handicraftsmen and workers at a furnace who labour from night to night and with difficulty procure the necessaries of life and let us hear them bewailing their fate and filling up their sleepless hours with lamentations and tears or let us reckon up the sailor's life passed in the midst of so many dangers and which as bias has shown is neither amongst the living nor the dead for the man who belongs to earth has as if he were amphibious thrown himself upon the sea and become wholly in the power of fortune but farming is at least a pleasant thing clearly so but is it not wholly a sore for ever finding for itself a pretext for sorrow crying now at a drought now at a continued rain now at a burning up now at a mildew now at unseasonable heat or cold and the much honoured statesmanship for many things i pass over through revolutions how great is it driven while it possesses a pleasure like that of a state of fever in its quiverings and palpitations but a failure full of pain and worse than a thousand deaths who then living for the mob can be happy even if he has been favourably received with a gentle buzz or noisy hubbub as the plaything of the people but afterwards rejected hissed fined put to death and pitied tell me this thou statesman axiochus where died miltiades where themistocles where ephialtes and where recently the ten army leaders when i did not put the question to the vote for it did not seem to me a solemn act to hold office in union with a maddened mob whereas theramenes and calixenus did on the day after introduce secretly fictitious chairmen of the meeting and got against the men a vote of death without a trial and yet did you axiochus lawfully defend them and eruptolemus likewise while thirty thousand were at the general meeting axiochus it is so socrates and from that time i have had enough of the platform and nothing has seemed to me more disagreeable than statesmanship and this is plain to those who have been engaged in the business and you indeed speak thus as taking a view from a lookout 
but we who have made the experiment know it more accurately for the mob my dear socrates is a thing ungrateful satiated with the mere touch cruel envious uneducated as being made up of a mass of persons brought together violent and triflers while he who acts the courtesan to it is more miserable by far socrates since then axiochus you lay down the science which is the most free as the least to be prayed for amongst the rest what shall we think of the remaining pursuits are they not to be avoided i once indeed heard Prodicus saying that death does not exist as regards either the living or those who have changed their existence. Axiochus, how say you, Socrates? Socrates, that as regards the living it does not exist, while they who are dead do not exist, so that neither, as regards you, does it exist, for you are not dead, nor, should you suffer aught, will it exist, as regards you, for you will then not exist. Vain, then, is the sorrow in Axiochus, grieving for Axiochus, touching a thing that neither is nor will be, and it is just the same as if a person were to grieve for Scylla or the centaur, which, as regards you, do not exist now, nor will they, after your close of life, exist. For what is fearful is so to those who exist, but to those who do not exist, how can it be so? Axiochus, these clever things you have said from the talkativeness which is floating on the surface of society just now. For from thence is this idle speaking which has been cleverly got up for the young men. But the deprivation of the good things of life is what gives me pain, even should you rattle out reasons, Socrates, still more plausible than those just now. For the mind, when it is wandering, thinks nothing of fine-spoken words nor do these touch even its surface, which affect indeed a mere pomp and splendor of diction, but are wanting in truth. Now sufferings do not endure sophisms, and upon those things alone that can reach the soul rests there any aid. Socrates, you are putting together, Axiochus, words without reason, in bringing the perception of things that are bad, as opposed to the deprivation of things that are good, through your forgetting that you are dead for the counter-suffering of ill pains him who is deprived of good, but he who does not exist does not lay hold even of deprivation. How, then, should there be a grief for that which is about to furnish no knowledge of the things that will cause pain? For had you, Axiochus, at the beginning laid down with me in some way that there is no perception to the dead, you would not, through your ignorance, have shuddered at death but now you are turning yourself round while fearing that you shall be deprived of soul and place a soul round deprivation and you fear that you shall not have a perception and yet you imagine that you shall by perception comprehend a perception that will not exist in addition to there being many and beautiful reasons for the immortality of the soul for a mortal nature would surely not have proceeded and been lifted up to such a greatness in action as to despise the violence of superior wild animals, and to pass over seas, and to build cities, and to lay down forms of polity, and to look up to heaven, and behold the revolutions of the stars, and the courses of the sun and moon, and their eclipses, and rapid return to their former state, and the equality of days, and the two tropical movements, during winter and summer, and the rising and setting of the Pleiades, and the winds, and the fall of rain, and the ill-fated trailing along of fiery meteors, and to lay down on a tablet what the universe is to undergo for ages, unless there had been in the soul some breath of divinity, through which he possessed the power of thinking upon, and knowing subjects of so vast a kind, so that you are not, Axiochus, changing your existence for death, but for immortality, nor will you have a deprivation of good things, but a still purer enjoyment of them, nor pleasures mixed up with a mortal body, but unmixed with every pain. For you will, when released from this prison, depart thither, where all is without trouble, and moanings, and old age, and life is a calm, and with no taste of ill, and where in a mild atmosphere of unruffled tranquillity you will dwell, 
looking round upon nature and acting the philosopher not before a mob and a theatre but in the presence of truth blooming around axiochus you have by your discourse brought me round to a contrary point for i have no longer a fear of death but already a desire to say myself in imitation of the orators something still more and for a long time i have been thinking upon things on high and i will go through the eternal and divine course since after my weakness i have collected my strength and am become a new man socrates here too if you are willing another account which gobruus related to me a man of the magi who said that during the expedition of xerxes his grandfather who was his namesake was sent to delos to watch over the island where the two deities presided according to some brazen tablets that opis and hecyrgus had brought from the hyperboreans and that he learnt that after the soul was released from the body it departed to the uncertain spot and some dwelling underground where is the royal palace of pluto not less than the hall of zeus inasmuch as the earth possesses the middle portion of the world and the pole of heaven is spherical of which the gods of heaven have obtained by lot one portion of the hemisphere and the gods below the other being some of them brothers and others the children of brothers and that the gates before the road to pluto's domain are fast bound by iron locks and keys and that the river acheron receives him who has opened them and after it cocytus both of which it is necessary for him to pass over and to be led to minos and radamanthus where is what is called the plain of truth there are they seated as judges to sift each of the comers as to what life he had led and in what pursuits he had dwelt in the body and that to tell a falsehood is out of his power on such then as a kind daimon has breathed during life these are located in the region of the pious there without stint the seasons bloom with every kind of produce and fountains of pure water flow and everywhere are meadows made beautiful by flowers of varied hues and places of discussions for philosophers and theatres of poets and cyclic choirs and the hearing of music and elegant banquets and feasts self-furnished and an unmixed freedom from pain and a delightful mode of living nor is produced there violent cold or heat but a well-tempered air is diffused around mixed with the sun's mild beams there is the seat of honour to those who have shared in the mysteries for they perform together their holy rites even thither how then is there not to you first a share in the honour as being of the family of the goddesses and there is a report that heracles and dionysius descended to hades after having previously shared in the mysteries here and that they put on a boldness for the journey thither from the eleusinian rites but they whose life has been passed in a course of evil doings are driven by the furies to erebus and chaos through tartarus where is the region of the impious and the unfilled urns of the daughters of damius and the thirst of tantalus and the entrails of tituus and the uncompleted stone of sisyphus to whom begins again his labour's end there too are persons licked round by wild beasts and terrified by the torches of the furies glaring round them and enduring every kind of ignominious treatment they are by eternal punishments worn down this account did i hear from gobruus and you axiochus can decide upon it for carried along myself by reason i know firmly this alone that the soul is wholly immortal and that when it is removed from this spot it is there without pain so that it must needs be axiochus that if you have lived piously you will be happy either below or above axiochus i am ashamed socrates to say a word for so far am i from fearing death that already i feel a desire for it so greatly has this beautiful discourse of yours persuaded me as if it were a heavenly one and even now i have a contempt for life as being about to remove to a better home 
For the present, then, I will cast up quietly with myself what has been said, and at midday you will be with me, Socrates. Socrates, I will do as you say, and for a while I will go back for a walk to Conosargus, from whence I was sent for hither. End of Axiochus.